My name is Christy Cobinson. I'm an emergency medicine and sports medicine physician at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. This is not a full review of the musculoskeletal exam. Instead, this is a disciplined, algorithmic approach to acute traumatic musculoskeletal exam, primarily for primary care physicians. What I think makes mastering the orthopedic exam so difficult is we're taught to approach every joint the same. We do a palpation, range of motion. We're taught all these provocative exams and we end up memorizing the name, but we don't know why we're doing it. So instead, we're going to take a focused approach to each joint and it's going to be rooted in the concept of what is your differential and what is your can't miss pathology. I'm hopeful that at the end of this presentation, you will feel more confident in your decision-making skills and be more efficient. Knee, you're gonna hear this many times during our examination. The most important thing to identify is the presence or absence of an effusion because effusion is pathologic fluid. It's blood from trauma, reactive fluid from arthritis, inflammatory conditions, meniscal or cartilage lesions, or it's pus in the setting of a septic joint all can't miss pathologies. So when it comes to the knee, the most important thing to identify is presence or absence of an effusion. If there's an effusion, your job is to think about five causes of a knee effusion. Fracture, ligamentous, patella, meniscal and osteochondral lesions, and rheumatologic causes. So if finding the effusion is the most important thing, you must master the ability to pick up an effusion. There's really three ways to determine that. First, does the patient hold the knee in extension? That should cue you in if effusion is leading to the loss of extension. Second, the ballotment or the bulge or milk test. What if you still can't determine if there's an effusion? And I've told you it's critical to be able to identify effusion. Then the next step is grab an ultrasound probe. What you would look for is black fluid between the quadricep tendon and the prefemoral fat pad that can help cue you in that there is an effusion and you need to think about your five causes. Cause number one, fracture. There's a couple causes of fracture that we would think about, femoral condyle fractures, but the two fractures that are gonna get you in trouble that you can't miss are tibial eminence fracture and tibial plateau fracture. Tibial eminence fracture, difficult to palpate on, but important to appreciate on x-ray. Tibial plateau fracture, make sure you push on a tibial plateau, especially if you see lipohemarthrosis on x-ray. Ligamentous. There are two ligaments in the knee that cause an intraarticular effusion. The ACL leads to a large effusion because of tear of the medial geniculate artery. But the problem is, is a lot of times we diagnose knee sprain as primary care physicians, and there's a presence of an effusion. If you're making a diagnosis of a knee sprain with an MCL tear, and there's an effusion, you're missing the diagnosis. Think ACL and PCL is the source of intraarticular effusion. Patella. There are multiple reasons that you can have an effusion in the setting of patella pathology. Quadricep tendon rupture, patellar fracture, patellar sleeve avulsion fracture, patellar subluxation, or patellar tendon rupture. Meniscal or osteochondral lesions. Most people who present to primary care physicians with acute traumatic musculoskeletal pain in the knee that have an effusion always say, I think I have a meniscal tear. And while that is a large percentage of patients who present there, ultimately meniscal tears we only care about in the acute traumatic setting if they lead to loss of range of motion, which should cue you in for the potential of a bucket handle meniscal tear. Osteochondral lesions, fractures or instability of bone and cartilage, can be secondary to trauma, but it also can be in the setting of chronic inflammatory changes in our young athletes or young patients. So be prepared to look for that on x-ray as well. And then finally, if you've seen a fusion, you thought about your five causes, your next step, if you haven't identified the source of that effusion, is that is a knee that you need to be able to tap and rule out gout, pseudogout, or septic joint. There's not an effusion, then what are the next pathologies you need to think about? You gotta push over the tibial tubercle. The tibial tubercle will not lead to an effusion in the knee. Second, you need to think about lacerations that could actually involve the knee. Current literature suggests you can either do a saline load test or a CT arthrogram. Third, what about the knee that, gosh, it looks like there's an effusion, but you do an ultrasound, you do your tests, there is no effusion. That is likely a cause of bursitis or inflammatory changes to a bursa above the knee. That can be secondary to infection or inflammatory or trauma. 
So again, when you approach a knee, you approach it with a differential. The first most critical step is determine is there a presence or absence of an effusion. You should be cued into an effusion if you see that the knee is just in a little bit of loss of extension compared to the unaffected side. The next, and my favorite test for an effusion, is the bulge or milk test, in which I'm taking fluid, I'm milking it into the suprapatellar recess. I'm then going to milk it back down and I should see a positive fluid wave if there is an effusion in the knee. And you would expect to see positive fluid shift there. The reason I like that exam is inner reliability is highest for this test. Also, you get that objective feedback with the fluid shift. The Blotman test is I'm taking fluid from the suprapatellar recess, I'm pushing it underneath the patella, and then I'm going to tap. And I'm going to compare that to the unaffected side to determine presence of an effusion. Again, if you can't determine it based on those tests, grab an ultrasound. If there is an effusion in the knee, your job is to think about the five causes of a knee effusion. First, fracture. I told you the fracture that's going to get us most in trouble is the tibial plateau. A lot of times in the acute traumatic knee exam, it's really hard to get patients to full range of motion. So I take them to where they're comfortable. And I'm going to try to push exactly where I should be concerned. If you can, try to take them to 90 degrees. And for large knees where maybe you have a hard time identifying where the joint line is, a good trick is just find the inferior aspect of the patella, patellar tendon, fall right off of it, and that will be the joint space. So pushing over femoral condyles, both medially and laterally, walking the joint systematically, both anterior and posterior, again, systematically walking it, pushing on the proximal fibula, posterior aspect of the lateral joint line. I'm thinking, should I be concerned for joint line pain that should tell me meniscal, osteochondral lesion? Is there pain over the tibial plateau that I really need to look hard on my x-ray that there could be a tibial plateau fracture? Once I've thought about my fracture causes, I'm now moving on to my next potential cause of a knee effusion, patella. I'm going to, again, just take in a little bit of flexion so I don't cause a lot of pain, push over the quadricep tendon, the patella, pushing on the inferior aspect of the patella to think about a patellar sleeve avulsion fracture, especially in our pediatric patient population, patellar tendon, and then I will push on the tibiotubercle here. Remember, tibiotubercle will not lead to an effusion in the knee. Next, I'm going to do my patellar apprehension test. And that's to determine if there was a patellar subluxation. So the kneecap kind of subluxed out of joint. It leads to a tear of the medial patellar femoral ligament. And when I review cases, this is the case that gets called the knee sprain or the MCL that actually they're not hurting over the MCL where they hurt is the medial patellar femoral ligament. Again, you should be cued into this because MCL should not lead to an effusion in the knee. So for the patellar subluxation test, I'm going to place my hand in an L shape and I'm going to push the patella laterally. They'll do one of two things if it's positive. They'll say stop, 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 or they'll flex their quadricep muscle, pulling the patella back immediately. If that's positive, I then push over the medial patellar femoral ligament, usually in a little bit of flexion, to identify if I'm concerned for acute tear. Next, when you think about patellar pathology, the most important thing to appreciate is loss of extensor mechanism. With a quadricep tendon rupture, patellar tendon rupture, patellar sleeve avulsion fracture, or a transverse patellar fracture that is ultimately surgical, all of them will have loss of extensor mechanism. So I take the knee into a little bit of flexion and I ask the patient, can you raise your heel up off the bed? That's a positive, that's an intact extensor mechanism. Any of the pathologies I just talked about, they wouldn't be able to do so. Sometimes patients are in too much pain to even do that. So I will actually take them into extension and say, can you hold? That's an intact extensor mechanism. So I've thought about my fracture causes, patella. We've ruled out and thought about meniscal pathology. And we'll do some more provocative tests. Next, it's time to move on to range of motion. To help us cue in, should we be concerned for rheumatologic causes? And should we be concerned for meniscal pathology? So I take the knee into flexion. I will actually take him into hyperflexion and see if that causes a pinching sensation that should cue me into meniscal or osteochondral lesion. I will take them into extension and just do a slight bounce home test, really testing for posterior joint pathology like meniscal or focal cartilage lesion. 
Remember, if someone has significant pain with range of motion, that's the time you need to think about tapping that knee to rule out your rheumatologic causes, gout, pseudogout, or septic joint. So now we feel like we've ruled out fracture, we've thought about our patellar causes, we've in our mind helped us identify if we should be concerned for meniscal or osteochondral lesion, we've thought about rheumatologic causes, now we're left with ligament. Again, the intraarticular ligaments that you wanna be testing for are the ACL. The ACL has its greatest integrity at 30 degrees. So we really don't do anterior drawer, we do Lachman's. And what Lachman's, what you need to do is you need to control the femur with your other hand on the tibial tubercle, lead to an anterior force. You should feel a good, strong endpoint. Understand that this is not a force. This is a finesse test. For those of you who have kind of larger hands, another way to do it is to actually control the knee in your own hands with one hand on the superior aspect of the patella, the other on the tibial tubercle, a little bit of external rotation and bounce, an anterior forward rotation to feel a good strong endpoint. Next, PCL. So the first thing you want to do with PCL is you want to evaluate the femoral condyles and the tibial plateau. We should have our tibial plateau one millimeter anterior from our femoral condyle. If they're equal, that actually should cue you in right away. You have a grade two PCL. If they're actually posterior displaced, that's a grade three. So before you even do your PCL test, make sure that you see that appropriate anatomic consideration with the tibial plateau and the femoral condyles. Next, if I do find findings on that, that there's concern for PCL tear, I ask them to flex their quadricep muscle. It's called the quadricep activation test. And what, the, what you'll see is you'll actually see the tibia move anterior compared to the femoral condyle. Why am I harping so much on the PCL? Because the PCL, in my mind, should help cue you into the potential for a knee dislocation. Knee dislocation, by definition, is a multi-ligamentous injury. And the PCL, or the posterior lateral corner involvement, is predominantly involved in knee dislocations, which 50% of the time are reduced by the time they come to primary care providers. So it's really critical to be able to pick this up on exam. The final test for PCL is you sit on the patient's foot. Again, I'm making sure that anatomically I see appropriate alignment, and then I'm pushing back with a posterior force. If I don't feel good strong endpoint, quadricep activation test is positive, you're thinking grade two or grade three PCL. If I see that PCL, the next thing I'm thinking is I really have to test this posterior lateral corner. Because if that is present, I need to, in my mind, be concerned that this is a knee dislocation. So for posterior lateral corner injuries, in the presence of a PCL tear, which in your mind should cue you in, I am concerned for a knee dislocation, I need to get ABIs or consider CTA of that extremity, a couple tests can help you. The first is the external rake or bottom test. And what I'm doing is I'm just grabbing the big toe. Not important you memorize the name, it's important what you understand what I'm testing. I'm lifting the big toe and I'm looking, is there posterior and lateral displacement of the proximal tibia compared to the unaffected side? So I would do so on both sides and see if there's an abnormality in that posterior lateral corner. Now the most sensitive and most specific is the dial test. I'm gonna show you two ways to do it. The first, the easiest, is to have the patient roll onto their stomach. And you're gonna take their knees into 90 degrees of flexion. And you're gonna compare the external rotation at both 90 and at 30 degrees. An increased external rotation compared to the unaffected side should cue you in that there is pathology to the posterior lateral corner. I'll have you rotate back onto your back. Obviously, in the acute traumatic setting, getting patients into this position is sometimes very difficult. So this can be done utilizing this side of the bed as well. Same concepts as the MCL. Focal pain, no significant laxity, grade one. More generalized pain, increased laxity compared to unaffected side, but firm endpoint, grade two. Really no strong endpoint, grade three. So for LCL, Again, so that I feel like I can adequately control the femur and provide a good torque to get a strong endpoint, I actually position my body away from the patient and utilize the bed to create the stability. I place my hand on the medial aspect of the femur and I provide a varus stress on the knee, feeling good strong endpoints at 30 degrees of flexion. And again, what you're going to do is cause external rotation 
at flexion at 90 degrees and at 30 degrees, feeling for instability to that posterior lateral corner. The difficulty there is you don't get that nice comparison as you do when the patient is on their stomach. If I'm concerned for multiligamentous injury because of PCL, posterior lateral corner injury, I need to go on through my rest of my exam. ACL, PCL together, knee dislocation. Make sure you're getting your ABIs. Next is you want to test for MCL. We usually talk about doing the MCL exam with knee underneath the femur so that you can control the femur and provide an appropriate torque. For those providers who have smaller hands like I do, I've actually made changes to it and I find that I'm able to create a better torque pressure. I actually will push their femur against my stomach. And what I'm doing now is I'm creating a torque and valgus load on the MCL. It allows me to feel the stability of the MCL. If I appreciate that there is generalized pain, generalized swelling, and really no stability at 30 degrees, I'm concerned for a grade three. Grade two, pretty focal pain, focal swelling, and on valgus stress, increased laxity compared to unaffected side. And grade one, you should feel a nice strong endpoint. The last test to do is a provocative examination. If I've done my five causes, can't think, can't find a specific cause of the effusion, the last potential cause is a meniscus tear. There are meniscal tests. Unfortunately, the sensitivity in the presence of an effusion is less than 30%, but the classic is the McMurray test. And what you do for the McMurray test is I would take and I'd externally rotate the foot, causing some instability to the MCL. I'm then going to take the knee while I'm palpating the knee joint line into extension, and I'm gonna do that at different degrees of flexion. Pain, pop, or a painful pop, would be concerning for MCL tear. For the lateral, I'm going to internally rotate, and I'm gonna do the same thing where I take the knee into extension, feeling on the lateral joint line if there is any painful click or pop. When it comes to the knee exam, you need to know if there's a presence of an effusion, then you gotta stop you gotta think about your five causes. Fracture, ligamentous, patellar, rheumatologic, meniscal osteochondral lesions. In your approach to the ankle, the most common presentation for ankle pain in the acute traumatic setting is an inversion ankle sprain. And while we call ankle sprain a lot, I wanna make sure we're all using the same terminology. A lateral ankle sprain, which we diagnose a lot, and it's the most common pathology, is secondary to plantar flexion inversion of the ankle which leads to tear of the ATF, CFL, and posterior calcaneal fibular ligaments. Even if you would say that I know this is an inversion ankle sprain based on mechanism of injury and pain with palpation to those locations, what I think is most critical is you say, I understand what a lateral ankle sprain looks like, but I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna think about five potential causes that could get me in trouble if I happen to miss those. So even if they have pain in the lateral ankle, even if they have the classic clinical presentation for a lateral ankle sprain, you wanna stop and push on five spots that are gonna get you in trouble. The proximal fibula. We all know the board test that that's associated with a mason new fracture, but I think sometimes what we forget is I don't care about the proximal fibular fracture. What I care about, as you can see, is what that shows is that there is significant trauma to the deltoid ligaments, that that force correlates up and ultimately that's what leads to the mason new fracture. So that suggests significant trauma to the deltoid ligaments, which are important ligaments for stability of the ankle and syndesmotic injury, a surgical pathology. There are three different types of base of the fifth fractures. Pseudo-Jones, which is less than two centimeters from the base of the fifth, is a pretty benign fracture that can really kind of be weight bearer as tolerated. But Jones, two centimeters from the base of the fifth metatarsal, right within the fourth and fifth metatarsal articulation, that has poor blood flow and can lead to strong risks of non-union if not managed appropriately, which is strict non-weight bearing. So palpation on the base of the fifth. The navicular is like the scaphoid for the wrist. It has poor blood supply, which can put you at risk for avascular necrosis and non-unions. So palpation there is critical. Also the posterior tibial tendon, which is one of the primary stabilizers for inversion of the ankle and a component of the plantar arch, can be associated with avulsion fracture at that location. Fourth, Taylor dome, Taylor neck. Dorsiflexion injuries can lead to these high risk Taylor dome, Taylor neck fractures. And the reason you need to push there is so that you 
are disciplined enough to look on your x-ray for potential fractures in these locations, which should be managed non-weight bearing. And then finally, our Liz Franck joint. The Liz Franck joint is a critical stabilizer for the arch of the foot. And if misdiagnosed and mismanaged can lead to early onset arthritis and poor function of the foot. So it's critical for our patients to pick up on that pathology. After you've said, okay, even if it's a lateral ankle splain, I'm gonna be disciplined and I'm gonna push on my five spots. I still want you to take five more steps for me. I want you to think about all the different ligaments of the ankle and I want you to test their integrity. I want you to think in your mind, should I be getting more x-rays? And the reason you're getting more x-rays is you're concerned about syndesmotic injury. Syndesmosis is what holds the tibia and fibula together. Or am I concerned for a distal fibular fracture and I should consider getting a gravity stress that would suggest that the deltoid ligaments are torn leading to a fracture of the distal fibula. Next, I want you to think about tendons. The Achilles tendon, the posterior tibial tendon, and the peroneal tendons. The peroneal tendons can have a subluxation event in which you tear the retinaculum that helps keep them intact to the distal fibular, posterior fibular groove. And it's important to recognize if there's acute subluxation of those tendons. Finally, you wanna think about some specific pediatric considerations, and then you wanna evaluate for the compartments of the leg. For pediatric considerations, always taking a look at nail beds, and that applies to fingers and that applies to toes. You're looking for a Seymour fracture. What is a Seymour fracture? It's a Salter Harris type one or two distal phalanx fracture that occurs right at that growth plate. And the complication with this fracture is that you can actually have avulsion of the nail plate above the eponychium. This puts you at risk for osteomyelitis. Also, it's very, it's very difficult to actually get appropriate reduction of these fractures because soft tissue tends to be within that growth plate. You can see what you should be looking for on your clinical exam and x-rays in the top pictures appreciate that you're seeing that kind of small nail bed subungual hematoma. It looks like the nail plate is above what you're used to seeing. And if you look on x-ray, it looks like it's actually widened at the growth plate because of the soft tissue that's stuck within that location. These need to be managed by a specialist. You can appreciate what looks like a fracture at the calcaneus. This is not a fracture, but instead an apophysitis. It's very common for pediatric patients to present with acute and they think it's traumatic pain to the posterior aspect of the calcaneus right where the Achilles tendon inserts. This is not a fracture, it's just an apophysitis that can be managed with weight bearing, physical therapy, and insoles. And then finally, we've already talked about base of the fifth fractures and how critical it is to pick them up. But recognizing your pediatric patient population, they actually have a fifth metatarsal apophysis. And so in the bottom x-rays, this looks like you would expect to be a fracture but recognize that the linear lucency is vertical. That's actually consistent with an apophysis, not a fracture. A Jones or pseudo Jones should be transverse. They will hurt on the fifth, but on their x-ray, there will be a vertical irregularity. That's not a fracture, that's an apophysitis. The compartments of the leg. In the setting of trauma, you can get fluid, swelling, and blood in enclosed spaces. And if there's enough within those enclosed spaces, it can lead to injury of both neurovascular and necrosis of muscular tissue. So you need to be able to identify compartment syndrome. We're always taught pain at a proportion or pulselessness, but that's not what you should be looking for. What you need to think about is the most sensitive is actually pain with passive stretch of the muscles and tendons in the compartment. And then you think about your pain at a proportion or neurologic changes to the nerve that's in that compartment. So the anterior compartment has our anterior tibialis, our extensor hallucis, and our extensor digitorum. The nerve that you would be thinking about is the deep peroneal nerve with sensation between the first web space. Our lateral compartment is our superficial peroneal nerve, which leads to sensation through the dorsum of the foot. It has our peroneus longus and brevis. Our deep posterior has our flexor hallucis, flexor digitorum, and posterior tibial. That has the tibial nerve, and so you'd be looking for a sensation to the plantar aspect of the foot. And our superficial posterior compartment is our gastrocnemius and soleus muscle, and that has the sural nerve. The ankle exam. Don't anchor to a lateral ankle sprain. Even if clinically it looks like a lateral ankle sprain, be disciplined. Push on your five spots. After you push on your five spots, I want you to think about the five more considerations. Judge the integrity of the ligaments, Consider indication for more x-rays. Think about your tendons. Consider pediatric considerations. 
and judge your compartment pressures. Again, most common presentation for ankle pain to primary care physicians is a lateral ankle sprain. So understanding where those ligaments are so you can define it as a lateral ankle sprain is critical. The anterior talar fibular ligament, appreciate how anterior that actually is. Calcaneal fibular ligament and posterior calcaneal fibular ligament. Next, you have the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament and the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament. Tear to these tendons can actually present as a high ankle sprain and can be at risk for more of a syndesmotic injury, which is ultimately what helps hold the tibia and fibula together. Then the deltoid ligaments, which are the primary stabilizers to the medial aspect of the ankle. Especially with eversion ankle injuries and tear to the deltoid ligaments, this can lead to chronic pain and instability for patients if not managed appropriately. So even though it looks just like a lateral ankle sprain, you're gonna be disciplined and you're gonna push on your five spots, the proximal fibula, recognizing I don't care about this fracture. What I care about is the trauma to the deltoid ligaments that's leading to syndesmotic injury and force that's coming out more proximally. Navicular, Taylor dome, and sometimes feeling that Taylor dome can be difficult. Again, the reason I'm pushing there is for potential osteochondral fractures. So I actually like to feel that I'm actually in that joint space by taking them into plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. Taylor neck, moving just distal. Base of the fifth, two centimeters down for the Jones fracture. And then the Liz Franck joint. The Liz Franck ligament connects the medial cuneiform to the second metatarsal. Tear to that ligament will lead to the chronic instability of the foot, so it's really critical to pick this up. Pain with palpation in that location, and then also a shock test where you're trying to determine instability compared to the unaffected side should cue you in for your Liz Franck pathology. So if it's a lateral ankle sprain, I pushed on my five spots, I still don't see any of those as being pathologic. We talk about auto ankle rules, and that's where you say you have six pain over the posterior aspect of the tibia and fibula, six centimeters. You can push in those locations, but when you really think about ankle x-rays, you wanna do a couple tests that should cue you into more ankle x-rays. The weight bear and the gravity stress view. When should you get those? You should get weight bear and gravity stress views if you're concerned that you have syndesmotic injury or that you have a deltoid ligament injury that could have also res resulted in a distal fibular fracture. So I now wanna test the integrity of the potential ligaments that have been torn. I'm going to do that with first the anterior drawer test, which is where I'm just taking into a little bit of plantar flexion, stabilizing the tibia, pulling forward on the calcaneus, and I should feel a good strong endpoint. Next, Taylor tilt. I'm going to take into dorsiflexion, and I'm going to invert the ankle. It should feel a good strong endpoint. My favorite test is actually the dorsal external rotation test. I like it from the acute standpoint, both on the sidelines and in the emergency department, because again, so often we see lateral ankle sprains, but the dorsal external rotation test, whenever that's positive, catches my attention and tells me I need to think about deltoid ligament injury or the potential need for more x-rays. So the dorsal external rotation test is I'm going to take the foot, I'm gonna take him into dorsiflexion, and I'm going to externally rotate. Let's go ahead and relax. I'm gonna take them into external rotation. What I just did, I have no pain over the ligaments that should be torn and should hurt in the setting of a lateral ankle sprain. Instead, all the force is going to the distal fibula and all the force is going to the deltoid ligaments. Deltoid ligament tears, distal fibular fractures, important pathology to pick up and should be viewed with, a, with gravity stress views on x-rays. So again, the dorsal external rotation test, a really critical test to assure yourself that you're getting the right x-rays and thinking of the right pathology. Next, we're gonna test for syndesmotic injury with a lateral squeeze test. Appreciate that the tibia and fibula are not just lateral to each other. There's a little bit of a rotation to cause that lateral squeeze test, and that should lead to pain and instability for an anterior inferior and posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament consistent with a high ankle sprain get weight-bearing x-rays on this. Next, you need to think about tendon injury, peroneal tendon subluxation because of tear of that ranaculum. So what you'd wanna do is take them into a little bit of plantar flexion, feel in that location, and have the patient invert and evert. You should feel a little snapping or subluxation of those tendons in the setting of subluxation. Next, the posterior tibial tendon. 
and you want to push as it inserts onto the navicular, and you want to test its strength with resisted inversion. The final tendon to consider is the Achilles tendon. And so what you'd want to do is make sure that you get them onto their belly, fully relax the gastrocnemius muscle, and then with squeezing of the gastrocnemius, you should see appropriate plantar reflex, consistent that the Achilles tendon is intact. If you don't see that plantar flexion, you need to be concerned for Achilles tendon rupture. The last thing to consider is always go back and think about your compartments of the leg in the setting of acute trauma. So for your anterior compartment, I told you the actually the most sensitive is pain with passive stretch. And what we know is if we passively stretch the extensor hallucis and that leads to severe amounts of pain, or if they have sensation changes to the deep peroneal nerve, that should cue me in for the concern of anterior compartment symptoms. For the lateral compartment, pain with passive stretch of the peroneal tendons should lead to significant pain and sensation changes to the superficial peroneal nerve with sensation changes to the dorsum of the foot. Deep posterior, again, is our flexor muscles. So actually extending should lead to significant amount of pain and sensation changes to the plantar aspect of the foot. And then finally, for the superficial posterior, the gastrocnemius and soleus stretch and sensation changes to the sural nerve distribution. Finally, think about your pediatric causes. Look for signs of Seymour fracture. Consider Seavers or fifth metatarsal apophysitis for pediatric patients with pain in that location. We've already spoken at length about a lot of the foot pathology that you need to be concerned about in acute traumatic exam, but we're gonna reconfirm the five things you need to push on in the foot that you cannot miss in the acute traumatic setting. The first, again, is the Liz Franck ligament. Attaches the medial cuneiform to the base of the second metatarsal. So pain with palpation in this location, along with instability when you do a test for the Liz Franck ligament should cue you into that pathology. Base of the fifth pain. The next place you wanna look for is the first MTP. 30% of our weight goes through the first MTP joint. It's very critical for appropriate push-off strength. So pushing and making sure if you have any pain to the first MTP or to the first metatarsal can help cue you into look for x-ray. Non-displaced fractures of the first metatarsal or fractures to the MTP are not well tolerated and need specialty follow-up. The plantar plate of the first MTP can also be torn in turf toe injuries with kind of a hyperextension. Taking the first MTP into extension, and if that causes significant amount of pain, looking for bruising and ecchymosis that should cue you into the potential for a turf toe injury. Also on your x-ray, you can actually see the sesamoids, which are these small bones on the plantar aspect of the foot, medially migrated. All that should cue you into turf toe, and if you see those findings, especially if they're an athlete, make sure that they have specialty follow-up. Finally, the sesamoids, which are the small bones that we have highlighted on this x-ray. How you will find them is you take the toe into extension and you're kind of pushing right at the base of the first MTP and you can feel the sesamoids come underneath your finger. You want to push there because you have the potential for fracture, stress fracture, or even sesamoiditis. Recognize what makes this difficult is 30% of the population has a bipartite sesamoid. What you can appreciate in bipartite is that the linear lucency looks very clean compared to a fracture. But if they hurt in that location, the right thing to do is treat them like a fracture and make sure they're non weight bearing with specialty follow-up. Finally, you wanna push on the navicular, like we've already discussed, and then you wanna look at the toenails, looking for subungal hematoma. If it's greater than 50%, consider the potential for a nail bed laceration that needs repair. In your approach to acute hip pain, in the chronic setting, the hip exam is exceptionally difficult. In the acute, it becomes simple. Your job is to understand what intraarticular pain looks like and to do an exam to identify if there is intraarticular pain. If there's intraarticular pain, you gotta define it either through x-ray or consideration of progression to further imaging, including CT. But then you're gonna think about five other things that can get you in trouble that can look a lot like hip pain. You're gonna push on the sacrum, the greater trochanter, hamstrings, you're gonna think about apophyseal fractures, especially in your pediatric population. Apophyseal fractures are where a tendon inserts to a secondary ossification center. And then finally, you're gonna think about potentially referred pain. Your job is to identify intraarticular pain. And actually the most important way to determine that is to ask your patient, where does it hurt? 
If they point to the groin, that's intraarticular pain. You've got to know the source of that pain or you have to make them non-weight bearing or consider further imaging. If they push lateral, that's when you get to start thinking about myofascial pain or greater trochanteric pain. But groin pain has to catch your attention. And then there's really three tests to do to determine if it is intraarticular pain. So if they say groin pain, or even if they still just say hip pain, the next thing you want to do is passive log roll. If this leads to anterior pain, that's intraarticular pain. Next is the Stinchfield test, where I'm going to take him into about 30 to 50 degrees of flexion, and I'm going to have him push up towards the sky. If that is anterior groin pain, that's intraarticular pain. And finally, I'm going to do a Faber's examination. If that leads to anterior groin pain, that is intraarticular pain. I've highlighted a couple x-rays there, two cases that still haunt me. One was a gym recheck in a therapist who did this exact exam and recognized this was intraarticular pain in a patient that was referred for physical therapy and who had never had x-rays. And unfortunately, her x-ray revealed that. It shows a femoral neck fracture that she ended up going to operative repair of that night. The second was a 12-month-old who refused to walk. Very difficult case, but as long as you know how to identify intraarticular pain, we were able to appreciate that there was fluid in that joint and this was a septic joint. If you've identified intraarticular pain, again, your job is to identify what that source is. Consider making them non-weight bearing or get further imaging. Next, you wanna think about five things that can get overlooked, that can be concerning for your patient, and that is pain with palpation to the sacrum. Sacral fractures recognize an AP pelvis is not an adequate way to evaluate the sacrum. So pushing on the sacrum, and if there is pain, getting a dedicated lateral or considering a CT scan. The greater trochanteric location. In the acute traumatic cause, the differential includes the potential for fracture, traumatic bursitis or inflammation of the greater trochanteric bursa, which is a fluid-filled sac that sits over the top of the greater trochanter, and helps to lubricate the motion of some of the prominent hip extenders and abductor. Also, you have to be concerned for morale lavalli lesion. A morale lavalli lesion is a soft tissue degloving injury. And in the acute traumatic setting, it gets commonly overlooked. What should cue you in is pain with palpation to the greater trochanter, along with a sensation that there's almost like an acidic belly-like feel. So it's kind of a fluid shift-like feel over the greater trochanter. Apophyseal fractures, commonly, commonly overlooked and missed, especially for primary care providers. So understanding that there's a couple apophyseal fractures that are common presentations and that you need to push on and look for on your x-rays. X-rays are almost always read as negative acute in the acute setting. So making sure you push in these locations of the sartorius, the rectus femoris, the hamstring, and testing the iliopsoas muscle. For the acute hip pain, identifying intraarticular pain with passive log roll, taking the patient into the Stinchfield exam, having them push up. If that leads to intraarticular or anterior pain, that is, that's when you need to get concerned. And then taking them to the Faber's exam and looking again for anterior groin pain. Then you're gonna think about the five things that can commonly overlooked apophyseal fractures. So I'm going to push over the anterior superior iliac spine location of the sartorius. I'm going to push on the anterior inferior iliac spine, the location of the rectus femoris. There's still one more I'm going to think about when I look on x-ray, and that's the iliopsoas that inserts at the lesser trochanter. And then I'm going to rotate the patient onto their side. Think about my greater trochanter pathology, looking for swelling and a fluid-filled sensation over the greater tr trochanter consistent with a morale of all lesion, having them rotate onto their belly, pushing on the sacrum, and if there is sacral pain, thinking about getting dedicated x-rays to include inlet, outlet, or CT imaging. Then I'm going to consider proximal hamstring avulsion injuries. So pushing over the ischial tuberosity and then testing the strength of the hamstring by asking them to flex their knee against resistance with palpation in that location. Remember, in your pediatric population, this is also a site of a common apophyseal fracture. In your approach to the acute traumatic shoulder, differential becomes exceptionally important because the shoulder exam is so complicated. We've all learned provocative exams on the shoulder, but what's most important is you understand what are you testing. So the causes of shoulder pain include traumatic or atraumatic, Traumatic shoulder pain, the five causes are 
bone, tendon rotator cuff, ligamentous dislocation, joint capsule, and referred. So let's break it down and talk about the differential as you approach a shoulder. For the traumatic shoulder, bone. This is where you'd be concerned about your fractures. So you wanna palpate on specific locations to help cue you in to look on your x-rays for potential fractures. When you're talking about potential fractures location in the shoulder, I don't just focus on the shoulder. I start at the sternum, at the sternoclavicular joints, the proximal clavicle, mid-clavicle, distal clavicle. I push on the AC joint. I push on the acromion. I push on the scapular spine. I push on the scapular body. I then push on the proximal humerus, but I don't forget about my referred pain. I also will do a squeeze test of the anterior chest and a lateral squeeze test to assure I'm not overlooking rib fractures. Next, ligamentous or dislocation. Looking for squaring off of the shoulder to suggest an anterior shoulder dislocation. Looking for someone who's kind of holding an adduction for posterior shoulder dislocation, but not forgetting that subluxation and dislocations can occur to the SC joint and to the AC joint. This top x-ray really highlights an important concept. This x-ray was read as an acute AC joint injury. And the reason they read that is because what they saw was superior migration of the clavicle compared to the acromion. But what's important to recognize is what was actually missed and would have been missed if you weren't disciplined in pushing in all of your potential spots was actually a posterior SC dislocation. A posterior SC dislocation is a medical emergency because of the critical structures, neuro, vascular, mediastinal, and lung that sit in the posterior component. So stay disciplined in your approach. And recognize that just getting a shoulder x-ray is not an adequate way to evaluate for an AC joint injury. Because an AC joint injury, as it increases its grade, actually leads to pain more in the anterior aspect of the shoulder to the coracoclavicular ligaments. Tearing of those is ultimately what leads to the superior migration of the shoulder. So obtaining bilateral clavicles as highlighted in this lower x-ray is what, how you actually define an AC joint injury, where you can see the displacement of the coracoclavicular ligaments compared to the unaffected side. When you see signs of a potential shoulder dislocation, if they're over the age of 55, get an x-ray first. While this x-ray shows a greater tuberosity fracture in the setting of an anterior shoulder dislocation, which is an okay situation to reduce the shoulder, it's important to recognize that they run a risk of an anatomic or surgical neck proximal humerus fracture, which should not be reduced in the acute setting. Tendon and rotator cuff. We all think about shoulder pain coming from the rotator cuff musculature and really the ro rotator cuff tendons with acute tears. We think about the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. But it's important to remember that there's also the long head of the biceps, which inserts into the superior labrum. Acute tear of that can lead to a biceps deformity of the arm, so taking a look into that location. Also the pectoralis major tendon, so palpation in that location and looking for an ipsilateral nipple drop. Finally, if you've thought about fracture can, can't identify a source, you've thought about ligamentous or dislocation, clinical exam x-rays aren't consistent with that, you've tested the rotator cuff and that doesn't seem to be the pathology, think about the shoulder joint itself. You obviously can't push on the glenoid, so look and be disciplined in your approach to your x-rays to look for the potential for glenoid fractures. And if you have pain with multiple ranges of motion, don't forget about septic joint that needs to be tapped in those situations. And then finally, referred pain. Hopefully everybody appreciates on this x-ray that in the presence of that distal clavicle fracture, you can't overlook the tension pneumothorax associated with it. So considering, is this neck pathology? Is it aortic dissection or unstable angina? Is this a pulmonary embolism or a pneumothorax? Is it actually referred pain from the abdomen or is there another myofascial concern? Okay, remembering acute traumatic shoulder, you're thinking about your five causes. First is fracture, and that's where palpation becomes so important, but it's a disciplined palpation. Pushing on the sternum, SC joint, pushing on proximal clavicle, mid-clavicle, distal clavicle, pushing on the AC joint, but then going back down and pushing on the coracoclavicular ligaments as well. Pushing on the acromion, pushing on the scapular spine, the scapular body, the proximal humerus. That helps cue me in is fracture, my cause of shoulder pain. Next, I'm thinking ligamentous or dislocation. 
So I'm looking at the shoulder, identifying if there's kind of a squaring of the shoulder. Over the age of 55, I'm getting an x-ray before I try a reduction. Next, I'm going back and looking at the SC joint. Is there abnormal placement of the SC joint compared to the unaffected side? Is there pain with palpation? Am I concerned for a posterior SC joint dislocation? And if I am, I'm making sure I feel pulses on the affected side. A posterior SC joint dislocation should not be reduced time of. It should be sent to a center where both an orthopedic surgeon and a thoracic surgeon can appropriately reduce that fracture. Next, from a dislocation standpoint, I'm pushing over my AC joint, pushing on my coracoclavicular ligaments, and identifying if I'm seeing superior migration that would be consistent with an AC joint injury. If I don't see that there is displacement, they don't have pain of the coracoclavicular ligaments, I will be concerned for the potential for a grade one AC joint injury. And to test that, I'm going to do the scarf test or the crossbody adduction test. What this does is gonna put focal pressure on the AC joint. If there is a shoulder dislocation, being able to assess the axillary nerve becomes important both pre and post reduction. The axillary nerve leads to sensation to the lateral deltoid. It also helps to innervate the deltoid, so having them assess the posterior deltoid strength and the lateral deltoid strength. Next, we think tendon and rotator cuff. Remembering we're not gonna miss pectoralis tendon, so looking, pushing, and looking for ipsilateral nipple drop. The long head of the biceps tendon, trying to palpate it in the intertuberosity groove, and looking for signs that could be suggestive of a full tear with a Popeye deformity. If there's pain in that location, there is a couple tests you can do to really isolate that the long head of the biceps is your source of pain. The first is the Jurgensen's test, when the patient is placed in pronation, adduction, and he's asked to supinate against resistance. That will lead to pain in that location. You may also feel a subluxation as you palpate in that location. Finally, speeds test, where I take the patient into flexion, supination, and ask them to push up against me. Again, pain in that location. Now as we think about the rotator cuff, full thickness rotator cuff tears are going to lead to acute pain, and really range of motion becomes the critical exam finding to help you assess that. So the first thing I have the patient do is I have them move their shoulder into flexion. I'm looking for a couple things, specifically kind of this height test. So if I see that they're utilizing their trapezius to actually move their arm into flexion, I'm concerned for a full thickness tear. Next, I wanna test the strength of the infraspinatus and teres musculature. I would ask them to do external rotation. If they're able to do this, I know they have appropriate strength, but if they can't do that, I will take them into external rotation. And if I see that they flop in, that would be concerned for a full thickness tear. Finally, to test the subscapularis, I'm gonna have them do the belly press test. In a full thickness tear, you would see that the elbow would actually drop back. If I don't see that there's full thickness tear, then I need to assess the strength of the rotator cuff to identify if there is at least a high grade partial tear as the source for the patient's shoulder pain. To do so, I'm going to test first the supraspinatus, and I'm going to do that with what is commonly termed the empty can test. I don't care that you know the terms, just know what you're testing. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to abduct the shoulder to 90 degrees and take it into flexion about 45 degrees. And I'm gonna give some pressure testing the supraspinatus. Recognize it is not in full abduction at 90 degrees, which would be test testing the lateral deltoid. It's about this 45 degree angle and have them push up. Pain and weakness would suggest that is a potential source, but can also be in the setting of bursitis. Next, I wanna test the infraspinatus. And the way that I'm gonna test the infraspinatus is I'm going to flex the elbow to 90 degrees adduct, and then I'm gonna have them push externally against me, testing for intraspinatus and teres strength. To test the subscapularis, I'm gonna ask them to do kind of the belly press test, and I'm going to see how much force they can generate compared to the unaffected side. This should help cue you into rotator cuff and tendon as your potential causes. Next, you need to think about capsular causes. So again, if they have pain, not just with abduction, which so, so many acute shoulder injuries have, but they have pain with flexion and extension. Don't forget about your septic joint. That is a joint that needs to be tapped if you have no other source for their intraarticular pain. And then finally, think in your mind about referred pain. If I have done my shoulder exam, I can't find the source for it. I'm going to be disciplined in thinking about my five causes of referred pain. It has saved me so many times in patients in the acute setting. 
The elbow, similar to the hip, really comes down to one critical finding, loss of extension. If you have loss of extension in your elbow in the acute setting, that is because of an intraarticular cause, and you have to be disciplined in your palpation approach and your interpretation of an x-ray. Why do I harp on this? Because the number one missed fracture in the acute setting is the radial head. And the reason it gets missed is because we don't appreciate the loss of range of motion and because in the acute setting, the x-ray is so hard to interpret. In an adult patient population, if they have loss of range of motion and a positive posterior fat pad, it is a radial head fracture tell proven otherwise. So when you approach an, el an elbow, the most critical thing to ask is, is range of motion intact? If it isn't, there's an intraarticular source and your job is to identify what the potential intraarticular source is. Is it fracture? And making sure you're pushing on those locations. Dislocation or subluxation. Rheumatologic ca causes. If there's loss of range of motion that you don't have the pathology for, consider a septic joint. Ligamentous, and I'm putting that with an asterisk. We commonly see tear of the ulnar collateral ligament. And while it has pain with terminal extension, you will not see a posterior fat pad on x-ray because it is not an intraarticular source of swelling. And then finally, you can develop osteochondral lesions to the capitellum specifically in our pediatric population. So if there is full range of motion, there are still a couple things you need to consider. Ligamentous, and that's where we're gonna focus on the ulnar collateral ligament. Tendon, the insertion of the biceps tendon rupture commonly overlooked and critical to be disciplined in your approach to appreciate it. Olecranon bursitis, and then finally, soft tissue injuries. Fracture, x-ray is so hard, especially in your pediatric population. So if there is loss of range of motion in the extension, you need to be disciplined in your approach, specifically with the radial head. And if there's a posterior fat pad and loss of range of motion in a pediatric population, that is a supracondyle fracture until proven otherwise. Again, loss of range of motion, consider tapping that if you don't have a source for it. If you see a pediatric patient and they look like they have a an elbow dislocation, I want you to stop and I want you to consider that what you may be overlooking is a type three supracondyle fracture that runs a high risk of neurovascular injury. So making sure that you're assessing for the median nerve strength and for the radial artery, the UCL. UCL is an important ligament that helps to create stability to the inside aspect of the elbow. It is a common presentation that's missed because we're looking for fracture and not thinking about the other potential causes of elbow pain. And then finally, you need to look at the elbow in whole. And if you see that there is swelling, but there doesn't seem to be an intraarticular source for it, considering a lacrinon bursopathy or bursitis that can be secondary to infection, inflammation, or trauma. Soft tissue. Just like the knee, recognize that lacerations can be intraarticular. Again, current literature would say you have the option of the saline load test or the CT arthrogram, but consider it when you're approaching lacerations of the elbow. An elbow exam. Think about loss of range of motion, and then your exam is dedicated to tell me what my source is. Think about tendons, think about ligaments, and that will save you from missing pathologies you can't miss. I told you the most important thing is to determine loss of range of motion, and it's loss of range of motion with extension. So when I approach an elbow, the first thing I wanna do is I wanna see how the patient is able to range. I first ask them to do it actively by taking it into full flexion, and then taking it out into full terminal extension. I will then do so myself as well and see if I can get them into terminal extension and I compare it to the unaffected side, recognizing some people have hyperlaxity. So you may miss a terminal extension by not comparing it to the unaffected side. If there's loss of range of motion, again, I'm now thinking I need to think about fracture. And specifically for my adults, I'm going right away to the radial head because that is the number one missed fracture. So to push on the radial head, the first thing I do is I actually feel for the lateral epicondyle. And if you're struggling with that, what I have the patient do is hold their middle finger up and I feel where that extensor carpi radialis brevis inserts. And I know at that point in time that I'm on the lateral epicondyle. I then move just distal to it and I feel a circular bony prominence that I can feel even better if I pronate and supinate kind of pop underneath my thumb. If they have pain with palpation in that location, loss of range of motion, it's a radial head fracture till proven otherwise treated as such. Next, I'm gonna push on my olecranon, then I'm gonna to move to the medial aspect of my elbow joint. 
pushing on the medial epicondyle. Again, if you're struggling finding where that is, you can actually ask the patient to go ahead and flex their wrist against resistance and you can feel where their insertion is. And then moving into the soft spot, that's just distal and posterior to that. That's where you're really gonna feel an effusion in an elbow. And if you feel a bogginess in that location, they have pain in that location, you're not really seeing any other source of pain, that's where you need to think about the potential for some of these osteochondral changes to the capitellum. So pediatric population, I'm thinking about my lateral epicondyle fractures. They get missed. Adult population, I'm thinking about my radial head. If I don't have my fracture as my source of pain, again, I'm seeing how much they can range. If they have significant painful loss of range of motion, I'm thinking about a rheumatologic cause. In your pediatric population, another source of intraarticular pain would be the potential for a nursemaid's elbow or subluxation or dislocation of the radial head. You should be cued into that with a pediatric patient that doesn't want to fully extend the elbow. And if I find that I have a patient in which they talk about kind of having an axial load injury that holds inflection. I'll push over the radial head, and if I feel that there is kind of a prominence to that location, I will try reduction maneuvers, either with hyperpronation or with supination, flexion, with palpation over the radial head, and you should feel it pop right back into place. And then I'm going to move on to my potential external sources for elbow pain. The first place I'm going to look is if they hurt at terminal extension, but I can actually get them into terminal extension, is at the UCL. To palpate the UCL, I'm going to push on the medial epicondyle, and I'm gonna move just distal and you can feel the ligamentous structure in that location. In the acute setting, you're gonna see swelling in that location. They're gonna have pain at terminal extension. And I will try to do just a little valgus stress compared to the unaffected side to identify degree of laxity. To do so, I have the elbow in about 30 degrees of flexion, and I'm placing just a slight valgus stress on the elbow, comparing it to the unaffected side. If that's not the source of the pain, I think about my other tendinous cause of pain, which is the insertion of the biceps. As these biceps insert onto the radius, it allows you to do a little hook test. And what you can do is actually hook your finger over that biceps tendon. Be careful because there's an aponeurosis that can give you a positive sensation that you actually have it intact. So I do actually place a significant amount of pressure there to assure that it is a full thickness tear of that biceps tendon. Finally, I'm looking at the olecranon on bursa. If I see significant swelling in that location, I'm considering bursitis, potential causes, inflammatory, traumatic, or septic, making sure I consider the clinical presentation. If I had to think of the most difficult acute traumatic musculoskeletal exam, it's the hand on the wrist. Why? Missing certain pathology is very high risk for your patient. So we're gonna talk about five potential causes of hand and wrist pain to keep you disciplined and making sure you're pushing on those high risk locations. The five causes of wrist and hand pain include fracture, tendon, ligament, dislocation, rheumatologic, and soft tissue. Fracture, we're all well versed to push over the anatomic stuff box because of the potential for a scaphoid fracture. If you look at the literature, there's actually a better way for us to push on the scaphoid and interpret if there is concern for a fracture and why do we worry about it? Because of the high risk of avascular necrosis or non-union, especially to proximal pole fractures of a scaphoid secondary to the way that the blood flow rose. Second, scaphalunate injuries, triquetral fractures, number one missed fracture in the acute setting in the hand. So making sure you push over the triquetrum, tendon, Range of motion actually becomes the best way to evaluate for potential tendon injury. Tendon injury to include mallet finger, jersey finger, central tendon injury. So making sure you're disciplined in your range of motion and then testing those range of motion for your tendon. Dislocation. Dislocation and ligamentous I put very similar. And the reason I'm even gonna talk about it is because it's a common presentation to the acute primary care physician, but it's important to understand this pathology. The most common way to dislocate a finger is actually in the dorsal displacement, and the most common location for that is the proximal interphalangeal joint. So while it's easy to reduce by simply doing 
ex to axial traction, extension, and flexion, what you have to be disciplined to appreciate is to get an x-ray afterwards. And if you see that small fracture at the PIP joint near the volar plate, this is the type of injury that should actually be held in flexion of 45 degrees. If you don't appropriately manage it, you're not managing the fracture. What you're actually more concerned about is the volar plate, and that can lead to complications for your patient. There's a couple ligaments we always need to consider in the hand that are high risk that you look for on your x-rays and you look for on your exam. The DRUJ, the scaphalunate, the UCL and then thinking about your paralunate or lunate. Finally, soft tissue. Just like we talked about the Seymour fracture in the foot. If you see Salter Harris one or two distal phalanx fractures with subungual changes, think about Seymour fracture. We've already discussed that management. If you have a subungual hematoma of greater than 100%, consider a nail bed laceration. That is a nail that should be removed with appropriate fixation of that laceration. And while it's not traumatic, it can be, especially in the setting of high pressure injury, always think about flexor tenus synovitis, which is inflection of the flexor tendon sheath, presenting with flexion, fusiform swelling, pain, and pain with extension, which is a can't miss medical emergency in the hand conditions. Fracture. Again, when you look at the hand and wrist exam, the most critical step is palpation. And the first place I'm actually gonna have you palpate is Lister's tubercle, why? Because so much of the landmarks come off being able to recognize Lister's tubercle. To recognize Lister's tubercle, you move towards the distal aspect of the radius. You look for the most proximal extension crease in line to the second metacarpal. It's also just proximal to the extensor pollicis longus, and you should feel a little bony prominence that feels like crepitus. Moving just distal to that, that's where the proximal pull of the scaphoid is, the most concerning fracture that we are going to deal with. If they have pain in that location, I'm concerned. That's someone that I'm going to splint with follow-up. I then feel for other potential sources of scaphoid pain and push in the anatomic snuff box that correlates more with the mid aspect of the scaphoid. And then I'm going to push, I'm gonna rotate the hand over and feel the tubercle that is prominent that is just volar to the anatomic snuff box, which is the scaphoid tubercle. Pain in those three locations mean a patient needs to be splinted with follow-up. I also like to actually load that location to suggest the potential for scaphoid fracture. So once I've thought about scaphoid, I'm going back to Lister's tubercle. I'm moving just distal. And once I'm in between the second and third metacarpal space in a soft spot that you feel just distal to the Lister's tubercle, that's the scaphalunate ligament. Pain in that location should cue me in to be disciplined for looking at the scaphalunate interval on my x-ray. I'm then gonna push over the distal radius for concern for distal radius fractures, push over the ulnar styloid. I'm going to push on the extensor carpi ulnaris and feel if there's potential subluxation symptoms, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Next. I'm gonna rotate them over. I'm going to re-push on my scaphoid tubercle. And if you're having a hard time appreciating where the scaphoid tubercle is, feel the distal radius, move just distal. You're gonna feel bony prominence and it'll really start to make itself present when you flex and extend the wrist. I'm going to move over volarly and the next bony prominence that I feel is the piece of form. Finally, I'm gonna feel just distal to that in the hypothenar space, and you're gonna feel a little hook bone. That's the hook of the hamate. Pain in that location should cue you into looking on x-ray. Finally, again, the number one missed fracture is the triquetral fracture, so being able to push in that location becomes important. That's really in the ulnar snuff box that can be difficult to interpret. The way to find that is by finding your extensor carpi ulnaris, your flexor carpi ulnaris, your extensor carpi ulnaris, and pushing in the soft spot just in between those. Then if you take the patient into ulnar and radial deviation, you'll feel a bony prominence kind of flip underneath your thumb. Pain in that location should cue you in for the potential for triquetral fractures. Next, range of motion. I first have them range extension and flexion of the wrist 
pain out of proportion. I'm thinking septic joint gout, pseudo gout. That is a risk that needs to be tapped. Then I'm taking them into extension and seeing if there's an extension lag that I should be concerned for a metacarpal fracture that has rotated and is leading to some of the extension lag. I'm also really cueing myself in to looking at extension of the PIP and the DIP joint. Specifically, what I'm looking for on the PIP joint would be the potential for a central tendon extensor hood injury. And then I'm looking at the DIP joint from my mallet finger, which is that extensor tendon injury. If they can't get to terminal extension like the rest of the DIPs, I will place them in full extension and see if when I let go, they have an actual leg, which should cue me in for mallet finger. Next, I'm gonna take them into flexion and I'm gonna watch them flex the fingers multiple times. All fingers should come towards the scaphoid tubercle. Again, the importance of being able to locate the scaphoid tubercle. If you see a scissoring of a finger that it doesn't go towards that scaphoid tubercle, that will cue you in to the concept of a metacarpal fracture that is rotated and rotated to the point that it will likely require surgical intervention if not appropriately reduced. Then I'm looking for flexion and I'm going to be looking for flexion of the flexor digitorum profundus and superficialis. If I see that there is a loss of extension or flexion to correlate with some of those injuries, I'm going to then go back and feel for strength. And I'm going to feel for strength against resistance. I'm not just gonna to look to see if they can actively do it because you can have a 50% tendon injury and still have active intact range of motion. So you gotta test against resistance. To test for mallet finger, again, I'm gonna take them into from terminal extension, see if they can hold, and then I'd have them push against me. To test for extensor hood injury, can you flex to 90 degrees here? I'm gonna flex the PIP to 90 degrees, and I'm gonna have them push against me at the middle phalanx, and you should see how it's nice and loose at the DIP. If it isn't, if it's very taut at the DIP, that should be concerned for extensor tendon injury. Finally, to test for the flexor digitorum profundus, I'm going to hold the middle phalanx and I'm going to have him flex the distal DIP. To test for the flexor digitorum superficialis, I'm going to hold the unaffected flingers and I'm going to have him flex. Next, I'm going to move on to my ligamentous causes. The specific ligaments I'm going to be evaluating for are the DRUJ. I'm going to hold the radius about two centimeters from the distal radius, and I'm going to identify if there's instability, both in pronation, neutral, and in supination compared to the unaffected side. UCL, important injury for us not to overlook in the acute phase. The UCL is so critical for our ability to hold and manipulate our thumb. You'll see it with pain with palpation in this location, and you can test for UCL stability by holding the first metacarpal, flexing to about 30 degrees, and actually placing a valgus stress. You should feel good, strong endpoints and always do your comparison side. For scaphalunate, they talk about a Watson test. It's difficult to master, but it's something you need to start making yourself disciplined to look for in your wrist. What you're going to do is put your thumb over the scaphoid tubercle. You're then gonna put your index finger in that scaphalunate ligament. Again, we found that by going just distal to Lister's tubercle, feeling the soft spot and the next kind of bony prominence is right at the scaphalunate ligament, right between the second and third metacarpal. So thumb, index finger. I'm then going to take the patient into radial motion. And if there is injury to that ligament, I'll feel a subluxation of the scaphoid tubercle. Finally, the last thing I'm going to look for is soft tissue injury. Again, thinking Seymour fracture, thinking about lacerations that could have resulted in extensor or flexor tendon injuries, and so assessing those tendons under resistance. My name is Christy Kobenson. I'm an emergency medicine and sports medicine physician at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. The goal of this presentation was to empower you with an exam that is disciplined and algorithmic in your approach to acute musculoskeletal traumatic exam. I'm hopeful that you will take away your approach is based on five causes of pain and effusion. And your job is to identify those five causes. So walk into your musculoskeletal exam with a differential based approach. I'm hopeful that after this presentation, you feel more confident in your diagnostic ability and your exam will be much more efficient. Thank you.